beautiful. That's beautiful. All right. We've got to keep this, keep this party going. Uh, throughout today's events, I'm going to be uh, paraphrasing some of uh, Frederick Douglass's favorite quotes. Fre Frederick Douglass is a, he's an idol of mine because he spoke truth to power. Even in the late 1800s, he spoke truth to power. Imagine somebody did, doing that today, you could be shot by the police, especially being a former slave. But what I'm most impressed about, and the quote I like the most, is that Freddie D stated that I am for the immediate, immediate, unconditional and universal enfranchisement of the black man in every state of the union. And as for, right, give it up for Freddie D. Because without that, our freedom was a mockery and we may as well maintain the name of a slave. Now, if you can imagine someone talking like that in the late 1800s, you'll see why I admire this man so much. All right. It is now my honor to introduce our first speaker of the day. Many of you are familiar with the National Center for Science Education. They're a nonprofit organization, scientists, teachers, and others that work to improve the teaching of science as a way of knowing, teaching of evolution, and teaching of climate change. Climate change is real, folks. All you have to do is uh, look at the news for the last two weeks. Okay, Dr. Eugenie Scott is their former executive director, a former college professor. Dr. Scott is an internationally known expert on the creationism and evolution controversy in science denials, and is called upon by the press and other media to explain science to the general public. She's the author of Evolution versus Creationism and a co-editor of Not in Our Classrooms. She is the recipient of, of numerous awards from scientists and educators and has been awarded 10 honorary degrees. Can you imagine that, 10 honorary degrees? I don't have one degree. All I have is a BAI from our local community college. You guys know what a BAI is, right? Below average income. All right. She even has an asteroid name for her. And now she's here at California Free Thought Day. Let's welcome Dr. Eugenie Scott. Please take the stage. Thank you. This is belt and suspenders. I wrote it out because I wasn't sure if it'd be too bright to see it electronically, but there you go. I'm gonna to talk today about science and myth creation and evolution, and because those topics are worth a semester or at least several books, I'm going to start by t reading you a bedtime story. All righty. I was a little worried because I was sitting in front and I was getting kind of blasted by other people. All right. Please don't fall asleep, or at least no sooner than you would when I speak normally. Um, once upon a time, there was a steam engine. It was pulling a train full of toys and food for the good little girls and boys on the other side of the mountain. Then suddenly the train stopped. Her wheels just wouldn't turn anymore. So the clown and the toys on the train started looking for another engine to take them over the mountain. They asked a big passenger train, please would you take us over the mountain for the good little boys and girls? No, said the passenger train. I am much too grand for the likes of you. Then they saw a powerful freight train. Would you please take us over the mountain for the good little boys and girls? No, said the freight train. I am much too important to pull the likes of you. Then they saw a little old train and asked if it would pull them over the mountain. No, said the little old train. I am too old to go over the mountain. I cannot help you. The toys didn't know what to do. Then a little blue engine came up to them and said, what's the matter, my friends? Oh, little blue engine, would you please pull us over the mountain? The good little girls and boys won't have any toys to play with or good food to eat if you don't. Please help us. 
The little blue engine explained that she had never been over the mountain and usually she was just used to switch trains in the yard. I'm not very big, but I will try to take you over the mountain. So she hitched herself to the train. It was a very steep mountain, but the little blue engine kept saying to herself, I think, I think, I think. You've read the story. And at last they reached the top of the mountain. The little train did it. And if you think the little engine that could is about talking steam engines, you're missing the point. The little engine that could is about the importance of perseverance, having confidence, being willing to give it your all. For Americans, it's a classic American myth in the folkloric sense of a symbolic narrative that reflects values and beliefs important to a people. For Americans, that's individualism, hard work, perseverance in the face of diversity and difficulty and so on. If the Hopi or the Arapesh were writing a children's book about getting a train over a mountain, the clown and all the toys would get out of the train, stand behind it, and cooperatively and in a community spirit, push it over the mountain. This is an American myth. Now, myths, we usually think of myths as falsehood, but they aren't, not in this folkloric sense. They are the most true things about a culture. They're meant to be taken seriously, but not literally. You're not supposed to believe there really are talking steam engines. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the earth of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And, the, and God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. You've read this one too. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear and it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. And the evening and the morning were the third day. Now, I suspect you have a pretty good idea of how this turns out. Um, day four, God creates the sun, moon, and stars. Day five, he creates sea creatures and birds. Day six, he creates people and mammals, and all of creation is good. Things go okay for a while, but then Adam and Eve are tempted by the serpent and disobey God, and they're driven from the Garden of Eden. And if you think Genesis is about talking snakes, you're missing the point. Genesis is no more about talking snakes than the little engine that could is about talking steam engines. Both are mythic representations of values important to the people who created them. Now, myths are unlike normal narratives in that there are several signals that tell you that you're in the world of myth. Often there's an immediate signal at the beginning of the story. Once upon a time, in the beginning, long, long ago in a galaxy far away. It's a signal that, okay, I'm now in the world of myth. I'm not supposed to believe there actually are fairy godmothers. Myths often, the narrative form of myths often involve repetition. The clown and the toys ask three trains to help and the fourth one finally helps them. That three and four um, arrangement is very, very common in Western myth. And the morning and the evening were the first day and the morning and the evening were the second day and so on. Often there are supernatural elements or things that you just would not expect to incur in the real world, like talking steam engines or talking animals or gods or spirits or long dead ancestors. Myths aren't supposed to be taken literally. How many of you seen uh, the Book of Mormon? Yeah, a whole lot. <laughs> Remember that scene where Kimbe tells Nabalungi that Mormonism is metaphoric? All religions are metaphoric. 
the origin story of the Mormon faith has nothing to do with, this is a mixed audience, having carnal knowledge of amphibians. You know what I'm talking about. You don't think a man actually had carnal knowledge of a frog, do you? That's effing stupid. Then he goes on to say, Salt Lake City isn't an actual place. It's an idea. It's a metaphor. So Mormons and others are not, it's a hysterically funny scene if you ever see Book of Mormon. It's just great. Um, you're not supposed to take your myths literally. But don't think that myths are false. They aren't, and arguably, they're the most important things to a culture. According to the Presbyterian theologian Conrad Hires, Genesis symbolizes the things most important to the ancient Hebrews, which is maintaining their identity as a monotheistic culture and avoiding syncretism of cultural elements with their neighbors. Think about what things were like for the ancient Hebrews. They were this little monotheistic dot in the middle of this huge crossroads of the old world that was populated by lots and lots of other tribes and kingdoms, all of which were polytheists. And worse than that, you know, the Sumerians, the Akkadians, the uh, Macedonians, the uh, Egyptians, the Mesopotamians, the Sumerians, Persians all kept conquering the Hebrews. So you can imagine the pressure from both within the culture, geez, they just conquered us again, maybe their God is better than ours, and from outside the culture to give up your gods, change your culture, and so forth. So how do you keep your tribal identity? Well, one way is through myth. So Genesis, which is the origin myth of the Hebrew people, tells them that their one God is superior to all the other gods and that they, the Hebrews, are the chosen people special to the God who is superior to all the false gods of their neighbors. If you look at Genesis this way, it's not about talking snakes, and it's also not literal. Day one, God creates the light and the dark, so therefore the gods of light and dark are vanquished. They're done. Day two, God separates heaven from earth, so the, guys, the gods of heaven and earth are toast. Our God is better than your God. Day three, gods of oceans and vegetation are displaced because Yahweh created them. On day four, the sun, moon, and stars were created by our guy. And so all of those, all the Mesopotamians and all the neighboring um, tribes who had sun and moon gods and so forth, they can give them up too because our God is best. Day five, God creates sea creatures and birds. That takes care of all the animistic deities and animistic rela uh, religions. And on day six, God creates people and mammals, which means that pharaohs and others claiming the divine right of kingship are also false gods and needn't be followed and watched. Genesis, in the views of this theologian, is largely a paean to the omnipotence of their one Hebrew god versus the many gods of their neighbors, tribes, and kingdoms. And of course, being God's chosen people, that makes the Hebrews more important than any of them and worth sticking to their cultural guns, so to speak. And the Bible, of course, is chock full of reference to this same principle. The first commandment is, thou shalt have no other gods before thee. Well, this isn't a big deal in the 21st century, but it wasn't a big deal in the 5th century either. Um, thou shalt not make graven images, the second commandment. Similarly, not a big deal today, not a big deal in the 400s, but a really big deal 2,500 to 3,000 years ago when the Hebrews were trying to maintain their monotheistic identity. So myth is powerful and not easily changed. But again, myths in this symbolic sense are representative of a culture. Myths thus are true in ways that mere facts are not and should not be underestimated in their power. Well, what about science? Is science mythic in this same sense? Does science work as myth? I don't think so. Science is a way of knowing about the natural world and we find out about the natural world by testing our explanations with evidence and against logic. And as such, the conclusions of science are gonna change. As we get more information, as we develop new uh, hypotheses and theories to look at evidence in a new light, the core ideas of science are gonna remain the same, but there's gonna be a lot of change uh, around, the, around the core. And if there's one thing that myths depend upon, it's continuity. 
Myths are supposed to represent values and ideas central to a culture's identity, and the shifting information of science is unlikely to do that. A second reason why science makes poor myth is that there's no single value or set of values that science reflects. Now, there are values within science, certainly. Uh, you can't cherry pick your data. Uh, you can't ignore the observations that, that refute your explanation. You need to be honest in reporting your methods and results and so on. But those are all values within science. They aren't the same thing as reflecting values of a culture. Scientists all over the world have to do science in the same way. You've got to hypothesize, test your explanations, restrict yourself to natural causes, rinse and repeat. But scientists come from individualistic cultures like ours, from communitarian cultures. It's very difficult to say that there are particular cultural values that are symbolized by science, since scientists come from such a huge number of cultures. Well, what about evolution as myth? The biologist E.O. Wilson has said that the evolutionary epic is probably the best myth we will ever have. And believe me, he's not talking about myth as falsehood here. He's an evolutionary biologist. He's on my side. Um, I should say I'm on his side. He's a much bigger cheese. The big idea of biological evolution is that living things share common ancestors, that we and all other living things are descended with modification from common ancestors. There are both theists and non-theists who relate evolution to values. The theists come largely from process theology, but a largely non-theistic movement called religious naturalism also relates evolution to many values. And there's a very interesting parallel uh, to these values, whether held by theists or non-theists. For starters, we are stardust. In the beginning, hydrogen. And helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, etc., through the periodic table. Everything in the universe, from the most distant sun to the boy next door, is composed of the same elements. And there is a power and a majesty to this realization. Where it comes to living things, the principle of common ancestry can inspire a couple of other sets of values. Consider that biological evolution means that all living things are not only composed of the same atomic building blocks, that's the stardust part, but all are different manifestations of DNA. The more similar the DNA, the more recently we shared a common ancestor with another creature. So we are most similar to our parents, our siblings and children, next most similar to our cousins and grandchildren and so forth. We humans are most similar to African apes, then most similar to the Asian apes, then most similar to, prim to primates, then most similar to um, mammals, and then most similar to other amniotes, then more similar to vertebrates, and then more similar to other eukaryotes. This nested set of hierarchical relationships of living things is what is, is hugely powerful and is, can be very much very symbolic. We are stardust, but we are also cousins to petunias. So what values can this realization inspire? First, because all living things are related and dependent upon the environment we call Earth, Religious naturalists and many Christians believe that because of evolution, humans have a duty to treat the earth in a fashion that reflects our dependence upon it, and in Christian terms, be good stewards of the planet. It's a perspective that largely rejects, entirely rejects human exceptionalism, the idea that humans are uniquely different from all other organisms on the planet and therefore superior. Evolution tells us that we are, in fact, uniquely different from every other organism on the planet. So are warthogs and slime molds. And people, warthogs and slime molds, all have descended with modification from common ancestors and have been evolving the same length of time. So there's no superior evolved creature on the planet, given evolution. Another value inspired by evolution from the arises from the evolutionary principle that all humans share relatively recent common ancestry with one another, and that therefore all members of our species are, evolutionary speaking, very closely related. As such, we have a responsibility to our fellow humans. In Christian terms, we are our brother's keepers. 
and we should be doing our utmost to make the lives of our fellow humans healthier, more educated, free from war and destruction, more secure, and their lives more just. And religious naturalism concurs. In my readings in preparation for this talk, I came across some process theology discussions of sociobiology and genetic engineering that I found fascinating. The Lutheran theologian Philip Hefner has written that as God is creative, so humans are also creative. And creation continues in this uh, particular theological view. But our human creativity allows us to develop the science to actually change our own evolution and change the evolution of the creatures that we share the planet with. As such, we have a special responsibility when it comes to this ability to, we have a special responsibility when it comes to our ability to modify genes and affect human evolution. This is not an anti-science approach, by the way. They're not saying, stop, don't ever do this. They're basically saying the same position that the National Academy of Sciences Committee a couple of years ago proposed, that we need to go into the brave new biology uh, brought about by CRISPR-Cas9 with our eyes open and reflect on both the biological and ethical consequences of this great biological power that we suddenly have. To return to my talk, Creation and Evolution as Science and Myth, I conclude that Creation makes lousy science. I talked about this a lot. Um, some of you have been unfortunate to hear me. I assume that in this audience, I don't have to demonstrate to you that creationism is terrible science. See me afterwards if that's a problem. And I would also uh, uh, propose that science makes lousy myth. But both creation and evolution have been and are being used as myth. There are differences in the use of creation and evolution as myth. For one thing, Christian Genesis creationism neatly fits the folkloric criteria of myth, both in narrative structure and in its ability to reflect values important to a culture. Evolution is less so, especially in the lack of the narrative structure and the various tip-offs, like in the beginning, once upon a time, uh, that indicate myth in narrative. But evolution is less so also in the idea of myth as reflection of a culture's value. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. For modern conservative Christians, the Genesis creation story leads to Christianity itself, as opposed to the view of Genesis as held, we infer, by ancient Israelites. God specially created Adam and Eve, and all was good, they sinned by disobeying God and were cast from the garden, thus incurring hunger, disease, suffering, death. In the New Testament, Jesus atones for the sin of Adam by dying on the cross. You know, Paul refers to Jesus as the second Adam. There are direct connections between the Old Testament and the New to conservative Christians. To religiously conservative Christians, if Genesis is not true, then there was no Adam and Eve, so there was no sin of Adam, so there's no need to redeem the sin of Adam, and therefore no need for Jesus to die on the cross, and thus Christianity loses its meaning. As a fundamentalist preacher once said to me, if I can't believe that Genesis is true, how do I know that Revelations is true? Myths are powerful and not to be taken lightly. Now, evolution is a different sort of myth from Genesis creationism. First of all, it's true. Evolution is the most accurate story we have of how everything came to be, and we continue to add details to this basic idea of the history of the universe and its living inhabitants on Earth, because it's science, and that's what science does. But evolution is different in another way. It's not a myth that reflects values, but rather a myth that is used as a foundation to support values. Like all of science, evolution cannot determine values, but surely it can be used to inform values, to shape and inspire them. In fact, Mr. McInerney made a comment very similar to that a moment ago. Note that the humanistic values associated with process theology or religious naturalism are not inevitably an outgrowth of evolution. Evolution is quite compatible with environmentalist and social justice ideologies, but it cannot compel these ideological views. Someone could take the same epic of evolution 
and seeing the extraordinary phenomenon of human consciousness conclude values very similar to those of Christian dominion theology. So yes, evolution is mythic, but not exactly parallel to the myth of Genesis. Evolution is science, and we have to be very clear in our minds, whether we are theists or non-theists, when we're talking about science and when we're talking about justifying our ideologies or values using science. Science has much too much been drawn into the culture wars, and it really needs to be left the hell alone. Knock yourself out using science to support your values and ideologies. It's good, clean fun. But leave science out of it. Science can inform your ideas. Science cannot compel or determine them. And I thank you for inviting me to think through some of these ideas with you. Thank you very much. Keep it going for Dr. Eugenie Scott. Thank you. All right, we've got to keep this party moving, but I'd like to uh, remind everybody how important it is to vote. Everybody's registered voter here, I'm sure, because power concedes nothing without a struggle, right? Never have, never will. 